open space, but also I think addressing more universal truths um, and working with universal themes as well. Absolutely. Do you think you could speak a little bit more, perhaps, about this idea of transformation? You, have this, you wrote this very beautiful essay a few years ago that, that spoke about this, this uh, spoke about this process of translation, of taking a existing, taking a reference, or taking um, a piece of art historical significance and really um, transforming that into something, something contemporary. Maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, the point of departure for that early essay was. And I think there's been um, a journey in Bill's work, and you know, as with most artists, a uh, kind of a development or some sort of a change. But in those early works, the thing that struck me is that it's as if one sees a certain familiarity with some of these early works, and it looks like it's sort of an, an easy process of translation and to translate something into your own context. And then when you start delving, you realize that these works are, are actually not so not so easy to decode, not so um, not so well rooted in this context, but actually speak to a much more universal context. Um, and I think that's what I found interesting in those early works, and it's something which I think is, is very present in these later works as well. It's works which start in these sort of immediate environment and then in the end talk about things which are universal. Absolutely, yeah. And then how how have you sort of thought through in your practice, this idea of transformation. Is it, um, are you looking at something directly, uh, a reference, or is it something which sort of over time um, seeps into, into your practice? Is it sort of an accumulation, process of accumulation, or is it rather um, sort of direct, direct quote? And is that important for you, that, that distinction? You see that as the sort of shift in your practice. So that there's a number of early pieces um, that you'll, you'll see in the exhibition where the, the sort of the references and the quotations seem to be quite quite direct and quite explicit, and now it seems to be a much more intuitive process. Well, certainly, but um, there was a time a long time ago when I came to a point of realizing that while well, we can explore many things with, with formal color. Histories or identities, um, that a lot of the things that are that are common to us, that are fundamentally human, have been explored and expressed exceptionally well uh, in the past over, over centuries. And so, I started becoming drawn more to those works in history that really captured specific ideas about who we are and what we do and how people from a different time, a different place, who were able to, were able to, to describe mm -hmm. through whatever means they chose, things that are relevant to us now here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was really interesting because it's, uh, it becomes a universal human trait that, that recurs, themes that recur over and over again. Um, I think we, you could, the travails of humans on Earth, I think you could distill it into the Pietà of the Marco and maybe two or three others that really describe the hardships that we deal with. Because we don't often make art about when we're happy. We, we, we would much rather be happy than <laughs> making work. Um, but the exploration, the really searching, comes from this context. Often, or uh, wanting to understand. And in that sense, it's um, there have been profound works before, and I think they would, it seems that they will be they will resonate as long as we are who we are, and as long as we are human. They will have a point. 
means it. I think it's super useful. Um, Ashraf, I know in your essay for the, the catalog, you you really try to get at this at this more this more recent work, which is much more intuitive. Um, and there's sort of an emotional power to this work. Um, and you try to sort of plumb, I think, that that power. Um, perhaps you could you speak a little bit about that and um, how that might relate to the shift in women's practice, this real uh, distinct break, which is um, which tends toward the more intuitive. Firstly, I'd like to say that Vim is the most difficult artist I've ever had to write for. <laughs> that is, without a doubt, extremely exacting for a number of reasons. Because he doesn't pay lip service to ideology, or politics, or representation, or even classical representations of the figure. And so, yes, there might be a strong influence in the Renaissance, for example, his work, but not a good. It's more the, the wildness of Baroque meeting futurism. So that incredible movement, the speed. There's an electrifying movement in his work. And that movement, I mean, is it's something that cannot be resolved by a term like transformation. Because transformation supposes a change from one thing to another. Whereas I see this work as actually the epitome of a radical becoming. It's a verb, it's an adjective, it's an inclination, it's a drive, it's a leap of the edge. And that passion. And that fearlessness in his work is what I particularly find exhilarating but also daunting. Because you may recall this famous line by Nietzsche if you look into the abyss long enough, be careful, it might be looking back at you. <laughs> and there's something about that daunting quality in his work that I love. And also, it attests to exactly what this was talking about a certain internationalism, a certain global, like globalism in the work is not defined um, by the banality of the nation state or even the angst um, and tragedies of the nation world. It's far more complex. Yes, there is pain, but it's a complex human pain. And that pain, and that's why I see him more as a metaphysician. And the curious thing about his work, you know, you can't pinpoint the spirituality. Yes, you could say they have definitely, yeah, sort of referrals to Christianity. Clear iconic referrals um, to that representation of Renaissance painting, for example. But I'm not convinced. There's a way in which it's actually an element of fuckery happening, the way it deals with tradition, the way it deals with faith, the way it turns it on its head. And that darkness is what I find it to inspire. And there's a certain ambivalence to it, isn't it? It's this, there's a tension between, um, I think, there's a tension between. Um, the way in which you can read the work. Uh, for example, even at the very you know, uh, very early works in your career, um, the suspension of disbelief. So this is um, a crucifix figure um, that is suspended uh, in the air with a CCTV camera that's pointed at it. There's, you can read it either way as this, um, as this sort of, uh, it's a, very positive um, sort of response to Christian uh, um, ideas and theology, or a critique of that. And there's the slippage between the two, and you have a hard time sometimes placing it. I think that's the power of the work. Um, there's this ambiguity to it that's really quite beautiful, actually. Um, and that comes up, I think, again and again in, in many of the pieces. Um, perhaps, Lisa, you'd like to? Um, yeah. Well I think it's something that interests me about Wim's work, and it's, it's to do with this notion of translation. I think maybe the work, it's, take for instance this work, which I think it's quite tempting to read these works in the media context and in the context that we know to relate it to, as I should say, nation state, to Christianity. I think the one exhibition, I think you have some opposition from, because it's a goat figure, it's a sort of hybrid goat figure. But it's, yeah, exactly. So these are. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking of another, another one, which is kind of a Christ figure, but it's in the sort of crucified position, but it's in a hybrid goat figure. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think so it's, for many people, it's almost as if the words lure and lure you in, it's as if there's something recognisable in it, and it's as if there's something familiar about I me, mean, especially the early works, I think. But in this specific work that Owen was mentioning, we start seeing. Um, so you have the, the sort of Christ-like figure, which is saying, 
um, defocalized onto a series of monitors, so and, and so the image starts breaking up to, to the end, just got this kind of blurred image. And I think um, for me, that's the same. It's kind of an early place where there's the dissolution of form, really, where um, a lot of women's work for me is a journey from being interested in this early subject matter to later works, which is very subject matter is still there. But form is interesting. Process is interesting. It's about it's about how he gets to what he's making, almost an automatic process of making and producing these artworks. You know, so I think many of the works lure you in and find something familiar in, but when you start looking, um, there's something quite alienating about many of them. Um, Absolutely, and I think for, to some degree, the meaning actually comes out of the, the process, the material, the materials. Um, whether it's many part Pieta, um, an early work from I think, 2004, um, which is an interpretation or a replica of the Michelangelo's Pietà, but in, in maize meal. Um, the, the sort of resonance and the power of it comes from that material. Or even the more recent work, um, the Dead Pietà, which is uh, which you revisited a few years ago, where they have transformed and taken styrofoam and, and, and carved it um, in a very sort of evocative way, and then cast that into bronze. So there's this tension there. Uh, again, that's that's actually quite um, quite quite attractive, and and again, that the, the meaning maybe comes from that material process. Perhaps you'd like to to just mention a few words now. Well, I think it's really important that um, there's a space between recognition and uh, and knowing and. Um, and preconceived ideas, and in, the, in between those, there's, there's a space that is ripe for, for um, perhaps a new way of thinking. And if you can, uh, it's all, uh, the idea of bait and switch, uh, which is a ruse, but it, it, it works in a similar way. If there is something familiar which introduces the, the type of a thought, uh, whether historical, but it's, it's mostly, I think, um, inherited. And if you can, if you can uh, create a, a small space in between where there's a pause, uh, that is described probably by the realization that that's what you think or what you see is not necessarily uh, what, what you're confronted with at this, at this moment. Some, some things are. Um, and I think that's that's a beautiful place to be, where where things are uh, liquid, fluid, and meaning and interpretation is fluid. And it can become anything. Um, and this is, I think, that's the big difference between where where the words used to come from and where they come from now. It's where now I, I revel in that space, where um, the offcuts of the process becomes. The more interesting fragment, and by constructing something from the offcuts rather than the intended. Um, so that this process becomes generative. Yes. The process generates. Well, certainly, and but yes, and then meaning generates the process again. And um, so that's your first question was about: Is it important? It's not any more important because now it's 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 a liquid process. It's it's like. Um, Everything around us has at one stage been something else, and we will be those things at some point or other. Um, there is absolutely nothing finite that's in existence. If you, if you see things as molecules, as, as building blocks, as parts of, of um, a whole that is much more important in the wholeness than in the specific current manifestation, then form and meaning becomes. Um, wonderful through the tools that, that can generate, turn in on itself. Um, there's a wonderful uh, fourth dimensional figure, uh, Deseret, which is a cube within a cube, but it's impossible to, to draw. It's, it's a conceptual figure, it's, and it's, it can, you can calculate it, and you can, you can uh, describe it and work with it, but it cannot be visually represented. So the only way to do it is, is a cube within a cube. But those cubes contain each other simultaneously, so the only way to do it is an animation where you, the center one opens up and folds on itself. I think 
Das ist auch nicht der Zusammenbruch sein, weil wir Objects can have various meanings at the same time. And all those interpretations are equally valid currently in this, in this one moment. I think when that happens, we can look at things in a different way. And uh, whether it's that color then or form becomes less important, it's, it's about uh, being open. I almost think the form sometimes actually becomes the meaning. In Dead Gaeta, for example, the sort of, so again, this is the, the, the work that's based on Michelangelo's Pieta, the sort of emotional state, the emotional experience that one can imagine Mary going through seems to actually be embodied in the form mm -hmm. that the, the sculpture takes. That sort of um, conflicted state is almost um, manifested in the materials or in the the form you call it. And there's something profoundly violent about creating, especially sculptural images, carved images of these scenes. Um, so there they are, in this moment of grief, um, forever, unchanging in that moment. The love one, the original love one, it's a moment of true anguish. Um, having done the right thing but being on the wrong side and being punished by this, the gods of the other side. It's a very poignant thing in our world. But currently, again, I mean, we repeat ourselves, but um, by carving it in marble, <coughs> there it is. It was in uh, Nero the palace. It got lost. It was a, myth, a mythical sculpture. Um, they found it again in, just after the beard was, un was created. <coughs> it was unearthed in Rome. And that's there are no coincidences. Um, but the idea of them in frozen in that moment forever, for all time, you know, it's, it's thousands of years that they've been in that moment of dying by a snake. Yes. <laughs> so by subjecting the, the form of the creator to these fragmenting new forms, um, it felt almost like there's a, there's a release. There's this illusion that's um, as if it's wafting away finally. Which it isn't because then it's in bronze. <laughs> bronze lasts forever, so that's a that fact. But at least there's a great progression. Exactly. Um, Ashraf, maybe taking on from that point, um, you, you sort of spoken about the way um, one of the Vim's installations at Stevenson Gallery, uh, the Kinyar Carnival and the Logic, um, is sort of broken and becomes. Um, almost goes through the process we were just talking about, so it becomes almost um, not disillusioned, but uh, broken into its sort of component. <coughs> Perhaps you can, you can speak a little bit about what you was just mentioned in terms of how you, you think about this practice. It's the reason why I find the work incredibly relevant um, now, because it's about liquidity, it's about dissolution, it's about speed which are the conditions which define the 21st century. We are not about being, we are about becoming. And that sense of that virtuality, that, that something called the media ray. So it seems frozen, it's a sculpture that the apparency is something fixed, something marmoral. But that's not the part of the sculpture that the treatment knows. It's actually the way the species refuse its own fixity. Um, and that energy is there from the earliest work all the way through, but more radical. As, as the sculptor moves through space and time and, and years, it becomes more and more fascinated by this. No, it's not dissolution, it's dissolution. It's that, it's that, that's the fascinating thing. And it's an extremely difficult thing to manifest in a material form. So, this is a curious thing to describe in the sculpture, it's something you're resting in time and unearthed or brought back. It says you have that this, this work is not part. Immortality, which is one of the traditional ways of thinking of sculpture. It's about timelessness. It's about being untimely, out of time, out of whack, breaking apart the continuum, kicking against the transformation, creating something much more imminent and therefore more alive than a sculptural form. This is what I find to be I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking of the audience, which most people haven't seen the. Um, the installation, maybe you want to say something about the way that the glass blankets are used. Yeah. 
to create this sense of, uh, you know, when you use the language you use uh, reflection to create that sort of infinite. Yes. Um, well, quite literally, it, it reflects. So, um, one of the important things about the maze mill here that I was not that it's made me all that too, but also that it was a mirror image of the original, uh, which turns it into uh, an antithetical proposition, uh, almost in opposition, but like a counter opposition. So that an idea of reflection is, is it's always been important but when it came to making a dark coin, the question was, should that be reversed? Should that be uh, set up in opposition to the original? In a face of, and it felt like it shouldn't, that one uh, almost deserves simplicity um, to, to be allowed to continue um, speaking to, to things we can't really understand. Um, so now, the idea of reflection became very important in that it gives us both the object as well as. It's counter in the same space, in the same moment. Um, and then, of course, if you start playing with multiple fragments of glass and multiple facets and angles, um, a single image can be broken up into a multiplicity of views, uh, which is quite wonderful because it refers back to the old cubists painting a single plane from different points of view. In this instance, it's spatial, almost constructivist. Um, but to be able to see one thing and see encased in it because of your current place, the position you currently occupy, you see a certain part of another reflected, or a part of itself reflected back to itself, or, or distorted in, in various ways. But what's interesting about this idea of reflection, and as you, as you walk through the exhibition, you'll see um, the, the way in which so as a viewer, um, constantly sort of reflecting as Lisa has mentioned, is that it implicates you as a viewer, as somebody who's, who's looking. Um, and that seems to be uh, something which has been apparent in quite a few of your installations, quite a few of your works. From as early <coughs> as Call Me Suspension of Disbelief, the CCTV camera catches uh, your view, or catches you um, watching or looking at this artwork to um, less of a trivia, I think, in Vanitas Tordet, where you're implicated as the, as the viewer. There's a bus looking into this central uh, composition, but the center of the composition is lacking this figure, which should be there, which historically is there. Um, and it's interesting the way that's now permeating. Permu <laughs> it's sort of replicated it's, it's, it's sort of in multiple now. Um, but that's actually been something that we seem to be interested in and engaged with uh, for quite a few years. And I think, I mean, I think the thing with that is that the the viewer is now much more active, I think, than in some of the earlier works. So the viewer is part of the process, and it, and it all feeds into this notion that um, when we are interested about this continuum of energy and where they can make feelings, right? So the, the viewer is generating meaning as much as the artwork. Um, you know, it becomes a super multifaceted and it's, not, it's no longer just located in whatever the artist's intention was, it's located in, in many other spaces within the world to have. Yeah. Um, the artist's intention is, is almost a side issue. It's not that, not that the viewer's experience uh, <laughs> is, is paramount, but it's, it's one of the many facets of the experience of the world. There's my, which is profoundly mine, and it can only ever be the way that it came to me, or the moment that something that's all connected to another. Uh, that's only one experience of it. And um, it's, it's not that I'm ambivalent to, to the experience of other people, it's just that I, I don't feel I can control or manipulate it. I don't try to convey meaning that way. <laughs> it's, it's really much simpler to just say something if you want to say it. Um, this is a, a cumbersome way to, to convey meaning. Um, so I make things, and I think that's where, where my responsibility about it should start. And if, if they're interesting to look at, then 
then that will happen at 27 uh, central. Lisa, you, in, in your, ass, your essay, actually, that I referred to earlier, you spoke about this idea of the uncanny, um, that the number of works of, of limbs, there's a sense that you, you're aware of what you're looking at, you, you know, you recognize something about it, but there's something not quite, not quite right. There's something which sort of is, um, I don't want to say disturbing, but which makes you um, rethink what you're looking at in a, quite a powerful a way. Perhaps you could, you could speak a little bit about that. Um, yeah. um, yes, I think I first thought about that in relation to it's that's, that's quite an early work, um, which kind of reconstructs, and you'll see as you walk through, there's some of these early works. I think the exhibition is kind of set up as a journey, so I would say it's a journey through Lim's work. Um, from these initial works, which I think is easier to read in terms of the sort of 